hello everyone. As I said, it's fantastic to see uh, friends from all over, from yeah, many years, uh, sitting in the room here. Um, my name is Bob Smith. Uh, I'm uh, the director of Dice, uh, and this is the inaugural Dice Talk. Uh, so we've decided a few weeks ago that we're going to have a set of monthly talks and different events that will showcase everything that's, uh, that's happening. Um, and we decided that I would do uh, the first one. Um, so in terms of what the DICE talks are aiming to do, really there are these four things here. Um, so it's going to be an open lecture. Everyone is welcome. At the end I'll have a um, show you how you can sign up to the mailing list so you can find out about the forthcoming events. We want it to showcase the conservation work of the DICE community. So we have staff, students, alumni, we also have an advisory board, we have associate staff. It's a way of getting everyone uh, in to come and interact with the, with the broader DICE community. As I say, it's going to be monthly. Um, and yeah, I'd really appreciate your feedback. Any suggestions on what we can do in the future would be fantastic. And the first talk is today. As you can see here, we tweeted it a few weeks ago. Um, and actually, it's been quite nice interacting with people to find out what they think about proboscis monkeys. Uh, Matt Struby kindly provided me with this today as a, uh, as a good luck mascot. So here is what I've there is uh, a photo showing <coughs> the species. And in the usual way that you get uh, in terms of informed comment from Twitter, um, got that here. What guff! Proboscis monkeys are beautiful. No animal is ugly. Um, now. The take home, the key take home message of the talk today really is that when it comes to flagship species, when it comes to raising awareness about different species, um, these two issues. Now if you're at DICE, you should know this already, conservation is mostly about people. It's about how people interact uh, with the uh, natural world and if we want to conserve biodiversity, we need to influence people to change their behaviour. And a key part of that, a key part of marketing, is to identify and understand your target audience. So, before this talk, I very roughly thought, what photo should I have to illustrate an ugly species? And at first I thought, well, we could have properly ugly species. <laughs> so the blobfish is famous uh, for, um, yeah, for, there's a um, group called the uh, Ugly Animal Appreciation Society which uses the blobfish as their uh, logo. These things here, the mole rat, this is a, um, it's called a rain spider in, um, in southern Africa where I work. It is truly the thing I hate the most. Um, <laughs> the first time I encountered it, we were uh, in a room with no electricity and there was something moving around. So we put the uh, paraffin lamp on the floor to see what was happening. And this shadow about that high just sort of went backwards and forwards. <laughs> I hate them so much. Um, but, yes, um, in theory, no animal is ugly. Uh, but yeah, I decided instead of tweeting that photo, we would tweet the proboscis monkey, which is the sort of, yeah, a bit funny looking. Um, apparently someone in the school finds them really weird, but most people actually really like them. So again, know your target audience. The proboscis monkey was on purpose. Um, and uh, yeah, I think they're nice too. Before I properly start, I'll be mentioning um, a whole set of uh, papers here that we've, that we've done at DICE. And really the common theme is Diogo Verissimo, who's uh, now a postdoc at Oxford. Uh, several of these came from his PhD. Um, as all of you who know him, he's a real powerhouse and has been instrumental in sort of defining this field. But thanks to all the other co-authors as well. And what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to start off talking about species appeal, then flagship species, um, flagships and marketing, and then finishing, uh, as I promised, on how we can save ugly species. And I'm going to start with a little story about seven, eight years ago. Um, a set of friends submitted an article um, about conservation planning, global conservation planning, and... Um, the lead author was someone from the University of California at Santa Cruz. And she'd never submitted an article before, so I said, okay, we're gonna do the cover letter. Um, so she sent the cover letter text, and I said, oh, that's fine, but you really want to try and make this look as official as possible. So try and have, you know, use your university banner at the top of the page, because then it makes us look sort of more professional and they'll take us more seriously. And she said, ah, oh, yeah, there's a problem there, because um, that's what our university <laughs> 
So oh. you can't see in full detail there, but that's a banana slug. You can see it's reading a, a book of Plato. And that is the logo that you get from the University of California, Santa Cruz. And the reason why is this campus is in the Redwood Forest. People who walk around the forest see the banana slugs. Um, and, yeah, that's why they adopted it as their logo. And if you've watched Pulp Fiction, the movie Pulp Fiction, the bit where they get covered in blood and they have to change clothes. So there's John Travolta in a banana slug T-shirt as featured in Pulp Fiction. Um, so the reason why I bring this up is this is really unusual. You know, we obviously know that not many places use slugs. Um, now, obviously, uh, the person on Twitter thinks that no animal is ugly, but as conservationists, we need to appeal to a broader group of people than just the people on Twitter who describe themselves as the Suffolk nature lover. So as conservationists, we need to be aiming for the, a broad range of people. And... Although beauty is in the eye of the beholder, the fact that that t-shirt has a butterfly on it rather than a really weird shrimp <laughs> means that actually you know, we know that there's a set of species that we generally agree are uh, more attractive and more charismatic. And there was a recent paper by um, Albert Al that came out um, just this year where they talked to, I think it was about 600 people, got them to fill in questionnaires. They also looked at how um, different uh, species were used in the media. And they identified these 20 species that were the most charismatic that came out from that um, study. And also as part of that, they actually asked each person separately after that to come up with the key words that they thought related to those 20 species. And you can see here that they divided them up into whether they're beautiful, impressive, endangered, cute, dangerous, or rare. And you can see, obviously, that beautiful and cute are two big parts of that. Impressive as well. So if we're looking at charisma, it plays a big role in why people like those species. The nice thing is you can see that there's also things related to conservation, and I'll come back to that a bit later. But in general, that's what uh, people like. That's what makes them uh, like particular species. So how do we turn that appeal into conservation action? Um, and the way we do it is that we use particular species as, as flagships. So the word flagship comes from this idea that a particular fleet would have the ship at the front that carries the flag. It's the most impressive ship. It's the one that sort of leads the way. It's the one that's um, emblematic of what you're doing. And flagship species have been recognized as a really important part of conservation for decades. And here are... Um, two definitions that sort of talk about what a flagship species is. Uh, Matt Walpole is a friend from our PhD days at DICE. Nigel Leader williams was uh, one of the former directors of DICE. And then Hayward there. And you can see that it really picks up on this idea that these are popular charismatic species, symbols, rallying points. We want to capture people's imagination. We want to make people support conservation and donate to funds. So it's this idea of using species that have got lots of charisma as a way of uh, raising funds and awareness about conservation. And this paper here that we did in 2012 actually looked at, uh, we found 59 different NGOs, different conservation international NGOs, uh, and we looked at the species that they were using as part of their flagship campaigns. Um, now we just focused on international species, so we looked at um, NGOs in Europe and North America, and we looked at species that were found abroad. So, um, as, because we thought otherwise the species that they use might be influenced by direct relationships. Um, so you might not use wolves in a country where people don't like wolves. Um, so instead, we were looking at um, foreign species, and there were about a thousand of them that were threatened and found outside those countries. Of that thousand threatened species, only 80 of them are actually being used as conservation flagships by those 60 NGOs. And you can see here, tiger is used 12 times, African elephant 11, giant panda 10. 45 of the species are only used by one um, of the NGOs. So there's a lot of um, species that are just being used over and over again. There's a narrow range of species that are being um, yeah, but they're sort of mo monopolizing all the attention by those NGOs. 
And we actually looked at what factors were driving that. We did a, um, an analysis. And we found that the two things that best predicted whether one of these species was going to be used um, is, first of all, does it have forward-facing eyes? So you can see from there, just over 60% of the species that were being used as flagships have got forward-facing eyes, um, compared to just over 20% for the non-flagships. And why is that? Well, we think we as humans are drawn to species that look like us. Um, and so that forward-facing eyes, even though it's often, yeah, for big cats, it's evolved just so they can jump on things and kill them. Um, even though yeah, this is the face of a predator, um, those forward-facing <coughs> eyes means that we um, sort of empathize a lot more with the species. Uh, and then the other thing was body mass. I mean, you can see that the uh, flagship species that are used are several orders of magnitude bigger than non-flagship species. And again, I think that's just this thing of feeling in awe of the species. Um, the fact that you know, when we're little, as we get older, you know, these large animals um, really capture our imagination. So because of that, because there's a small set of flagship species that are commonly used, because you can see that there are um, sort of biological factors that are driving that, traditionally, scientists have seen, and there's a scientist there, um, <laughs> scientists have seen flagship species as a sort of inherent part of the biology of the species. Here's a table from um, a paper, um, I think from the mid-80s, maybe a bit later, and it has these definitions and key citations for the surrogate species approaches. So a surrogate species is one that represents another set uh, of species. And you have things here like the keystone species, which is a very biological concept. It's the idea that there are some species that play a large role in maintaining the ecosystem that they're found in. Um, indicator species, focal species, you can see yeah, this is all about um, the sort of science and um, there were then papers that looked at how good are flagships in this sort of surrogate species role. And basically the evidence that comes through, uh, as you can see from the sceptical scientist, is that if you do the analysis on how good are these flagship species for representing other species, if you conserve them, will you conserve lots of other species? All of the literature that came out about 10, 15 years ago said no. These flagships are generally very bad um, surrogates for broader biodiversity. If you conserve the areas that are important for flagships, uh, you generally miss a lot of other species. So for quite a long time, and actually still, you will get um, scientists and biologists who see the flagship species as a sort of pretty dodgy approach. Um, and also, because of that, people have really start, started to emphasize, which is a very good emphasis, um, that we shouldn't just be focusing on species. Instead, we need to be focusing on ecosystems and landscapes and seascapes. So this is the logo from um, Aichi Target 11, um, from the Convention on Biological Diversity. So that is a target that all countries, apart from the US and Vatican City, have signed up to, which has said that by 2020, they commit to conserve 17% of their land, 10% of their water um, in protected areas. And a big driver for that was just saying, we need to focus on land and see if we're going to conserve broader biodiversity. But at the same time, this other scientist, this was the only uh, stock photo I could find of someone holding something living. Um, <laughs> so I guess we're closer to her than the other ones. Um, but at the same time, we know that conserving ecosystems doesn't always conserve the species within them. Um, part of that is that if you have a species in a habitat that's impacted by over hunting or climate change or pollution, you could have the ecosystem, but the species might be in trouble. Also, often there are some species that are found only in particular patches of an ecosystem. So if you protect it more broadly, you might miss on those ones with really narrow ranges. And then the other thing is that people really love species. Um, this is uh, a photo I took uh, from uh, Johannesburg Airport, um, just you know, battery farming of, uh, of toy lions. People really like species. Um, and the idea of ignoring that love, ignoring that passion, and just saying, yeah, that's old fashioned, we need to go towards um, 
habitats and uh, ecosystems, I think misses out on uh, a key part of what we're aiming to do um, as conservationists. And this comes to the role of marketing. Um, so probably most of you have seen that image by Magritte, um, the, uh, one of the famous Belgians. Um, so it's a painting called The Treachery of Images um, with the title in French, This is Not a Pipe. Um, and this was revolutionary at the time, caused a huge upset, because this was saying, you know, this isn't a pipe, it's a picture of a pipe. It's a representation of a pipe. Um, and a little while ago, for another talk, I did this, um, which <laughs> didn't, didn't get enough recognition at the time, so that's why I'm showing it. Uh, so it took me ages to do that and to find the font that matched that. Um, but yeah, that is not a panda. Um, that is a picture of a panda. Um, for those of you going to um, Slimbridge on the, uh, on the field course, which was um, set up by uh, Peter Scott, he was the one who drew the original version of that logo um, on a bit of paper, uh, and it became what's one of the most widely known brands in the world. I think it's like top five, top ten brand recognition. Um, so around the world, everyone knows what that is. The reason why WWF chose that species um, is really because it's in black and white, and this was in the days when it was expensive to do colour copying. So it was decades after they adopted this logo before they actually started working on panda conservation. Because at the time when they adopted the logo um, in China, it was difficult to, uh, for foreign NGOs to work. So, yeah, you know, this is entirely an iconic representation of a panda. And depending on who you are, you will have different attitudes to that. So those of us in this room will look at the panda mostly and go, ah, it's WWF, how lovely. Um, if you are living in a park that is where um, you're kept out of your protected area um, and on the side of the vehicle is that logo because they fund that, you will have a very different um, impression of what that logo means to you. So yeah, it's entirely um, context specific. It depends on the target audience. And that's why we think that social marketing um, can play a really important role in conservation and especially when it comes to flagship species. Um, so social marketing is an approach that's been around for decades and it basically takes marketing um, techniques, ones that have been developed in business, and it uses them uh, for, as you see here, changing behaviours for good. Now because a lot of those um, approaches come from business, Lots of people in conservation are still sort of uneasy about social marketing. Um, yeah, getting published on this topic can sometimes be difficult um, because some people think that you don't need marketing to show that uh, nature is worth conserving and so are uneasy about the idea. And other people think that business is destroying the planet. So yeah, it can be a real battle um, convincing people sometimes. But in terms of social marketing, this is used a lot in health and development um, and uh, yeah, can be really, uh, really important. Um, and there are various elements about it, but three that I'll sort of return to. First one is it defines campaign goals from the beginning. It's amazing how common it is in conservation to not really decide what you're aiming to do at the beginning. Um, that's beginning to change, but social marketing really puts that on an emphasis. It says, right. What is the aim of this campaign? What are you trying to achieve? The second bit is that it identifies the target audience and tailors campaigns. When I showed you uh, earlier the photo of, the, um, of Oxford Street with the wide range of people, actually that was a, um, yeah, uh, a bit of a red herring because if you want to annoy someone in social uh, marketing, uh, talk about the general public. The key thing is that there is no such thing as the general public. Um, there is not one set of ideas that everyone thinks. There's a whole set of target audiences. And so once you've worked out what you're trying to achieve, the second thing is that you work out which particular audience do you want to change their mind. Uh, and then you come up with campaigns that really relate to what they're doing. And then other, uh, another main thing, um, which I think is really important, is that social marketing recognises um, that how people value things isn't fixed. Um, can't really see it at the moment, but it always amuses me seeing people with um, Apple products with the logo 
blazing in the front. Uh, and almost everyone who has one of those products thinks that they're an individual, and that's why they bought Apple. Um, yeah, it's a beautiful bit of marketing. You know, it's, it's literally showing that logo to everyone. And when you see people with their phones, with the phone covers, there's that gap, so you can see the Apple logo through it. It's, yeah, it's um, brilliant. Um, so, yeah, you know, the, the amount of money people pay for Apple products is because they really, really value what's, you know, what's happening. And that's why Apple is one of the most profitable companies in the world, is because people are paying a lot more than they probably should for <laughs> a bit of kit. So based on this, uh, this is a paper that uh, came out in 2011. We revisited the definition of a flagship species. Um, we came up with this. So it's the species that's used as the focus of a broader conservation marketing campaign. So that was a critical difference to the previous definitions. We're talking about marketing. We're talking about a campaign. We're aiming to do something here. And the reason why you choose it is because it's got some traits, some characteristics that appeal to the target audience. So we're moving away from this idea of it's just you know, these species that everyone loves. We're saying you choose something that works precisely for your target audience. And actually, I think what came as slight, a slight surprise as part of the um, analysis I showed you of the different types of flagships that those NGOs use, uh, we worked out that there are actually three types of flagship campaign. There are three ways that it's used. The first is where the campaign actually directly benefits the species. Um, and the reason why it has a flagship role is at the same time it raises the profile and the credibility of the organisation um, that's using it. So this was actually something that came through my door um, years ago now. Um, the sort of classic example of a flagship campaign. So a cute picture of a baby elephant a very simple, strong message that um, will resonate a lot with the target audience. But actually, that was raising money for a, cam uh, for a project that DICE was running. So um, Matt Walpole and Nigel Leader williams uh, who I mentioned earlier, and Noah Sitati, um, led a project in the Transmara looking at uh, human-elephant conflict um, and ways of, of reducing crop raiding by elephants. That funded that project. But obviously, no one knew that apart from in Canterbury knew that apart from me, because I went, oh, where's this money going? <laughs> um, so, yeah, you know, you have a complicated project that actually involved uh, working with farmers to look at whether chili fences could keep elephants out of their crops, but that's the image that you use um, to fundraise. The second type of campaign is where the species is uh, a recognisable face for an issue. So, we've all seen lots of examples of um, polar bears being used in climate change campaigns. Again, it's a, a, res yeah, it's a beautiful species. It's large. It's got forward-facing eyes. Um, everyone uh, who doesn't have to spend time with a polar bear loves polar bears. Uh, and it links it to um, an important broad issue. And then the third one is it just provides a recognizable face for an organization. Now, this is one of my favorite um, flagship campaigns uh, that I know of. A friend found this in an old, it's like 1967 um, copy of, I think, the East African Wildlife Journal. Um, I mean, in terms of boiling down the essence of a flagship species campaign, you're not going to get better than that. She'll die. <laughs> Unless you send money, she'll die. Um, but also it says here... Uh, she'll die unless you and we help her, unless money is made available for the conservation and rescue projects essential for the protection of wildlife in East Africa. So this isn't actually saying, I mean, I don't know what that species that is. That's a sort of generic antelope. Yeah. I mean, it's a sort of a bit impala but it's a bit bushbucky. Um, but yeah, it's a sort of, um, yeah, sort of impressionistic picture um, of an antelope. Um, but... Yeah, as I said, that sort of boils down to the sort of the, the, the perfect um, sort of spot-on flagship campaign. Now, the thing that surprised me when we did this analysis, because you often hear of um, flagship species being used for, this, for these wider campaigns, being used uh, to campaign um, against climate change and illegal wildlife trade and all those sorts of things, but actually, 
only 2.2% of those campaigns used a flagship in that way. Lots more just used the species that basically said, this species is in trouble, we save things like this, send us your money. <coughs> um, and then 60% um, actually were aimed at, if you give us this money, we will spend it on the species. Uh, and at the same time, that will have broader benefits, it raises the profile of the NGO. But actually this idea of flagship species benefiting a wide range of, um, of other species, in reality, it's really quite targeted. Um, and I think the main reason for that is that if you show someone an emotive picture of an um, animal or plant, if you want to engage with them, they want to conserve that thing. Um, and so this is, yeah, potentially a problem when it comes to ugly species. Yeah, you know, if we've got a campaign that's sending money directly to the species, how do we cope with the fact that if a picture of a naked mole rat came through my door, um, I would probably behave in a different way. Well, the first thing um, to consider is, can marketing help? I've talked about the benefits of social marketing, can it actually make a difference? Well, this was uh, an analysis that uh, Diogo did as part of his PhD, um, where we had access to this amazing um, data set. So this is uh, ZSL, Zoological Society for London's EDGE project, which as you can see is evolutionary distinct and globally endangered. This is a project that started off focusing on mammals. They've done it for um, amphibians uh, and birds and a whole set of other uh, sets of species since. They basically looked at the species that are taxonomically the most different. So the ones that are um, the sort of, as they describe them, sort of weird and wonderful. So the that represent the greatest diversity of genes and that are also threatened. So they chose 100 species that are the most threatened but also uh, the most different. Um, and you can see here, here are examples of different species. And because of that, some of them are classic flagship species like the black rhino there, but then some aren't. Some are, um, yeah. Some of these are so poorly known that that's the only photo they had of one from a museum. There's a painting rather than a, a drawing. Um, and we have data um, on, because you can go to the website, you can look at a species uh, description, and you can click a button to say whether you want to uh, donate money. So this was a brilliant source of data. In the past, most of these studies were based on just asking people, which of these species do you like? Um, and in economics, um, it's well known that what people say they'll do and what they actually do can be quite different. And the jargon is revealed preference. So revealed preference means this is actually what they did. Uh, and we have data on the species traits. So we could look at body size and forward-facing eyes and all sorts of other things, but also marketing traits. And here, actually, it's relatively simple. We looked at things like how high is the species on the web page? Um, because if you've got all the species, you have to scroll down. Um, was it a focal species? They sometimes highlight on the front page, 10 or 20 species that are particularly important that they're fundraising at the moment. So we were able to look at the um, which of these factors was important. Um, part of that, we had a web browser where we asked independent people, we gave them 10 photos that were from the um, Edge website and just asked them to move them in order of which ones they liked most to least in terms of their appeal. So that's how we got the appeal data. And we found that, yeah, those three things explained what was going on. So species that people found appealing, which again is fairly obvious, but also if you were a focal species or a species at the top of the web page, you were more likely to get funding. And we did that statistical analysis. It came up with an equation that we could then use to model um, the impact of things. And what came out still quite strongly, for a given amount of effort, if you have... Um, a naked mole rat and a tiger and you put the same amount of marketing effort in it you the tiger will raise a lot more money and then you can see here that if there's no marketing the poor old um, least appealing species basically get nothing whereas the most appealing species get 10 and if you take those appealing species and put marketing effort in so if you make them uh, the focus of the website if you put them higher up on the web page you will similarly increase 
the amount of money that you raise from those uh, charismatic species. But you can see here that if you do the same for the least charismatic species, marketing works. So you can get to a situation here where if you put a lot of marketing effort into an ugly species, you will raise more money than an attractive species that you don't give any effort to. Okay, so this shows that marketing effort works. It is worth doing. So, how can we save our species? Well, the first one I've mentioned before, we need to conserve ecosystems, landscapes, and seascapes. Now, there is not just one way of doing conservation. A whole range of approaches work. Um, and if you look at sort of big international donors, um, governments, they will often focus on these um, land and sea-based approaches. Um, and it's often the NGOs that sort of fill the gaps for particular species. So, most ugly species will be conserved by conserving their habitat for broad biodiversity reasons. Um, another thing to think about, though, is the trade-offs. So, I've just shown you this. We see that the amount of effort that we put in um, can have an impact on how much the um, species benefits. The nice thing about this, again, with the social marketing, it's thinking, well, what are we trying to achieve here? Um, we know that all things equal, a tiger will get more money than this Russian Desmond. So this is one of the edge species, which again is so poorly known that here's a, um, a picture of it rather than a photo. We know that if we're fundraising, we should choose tigers. And uh, a friend of mine who worked for a big conservation NGO, um, their marketing people, whenever it was time to do tigers, would just be delighted. Um, it's much easier for them to raise uh, funds for tigers. But there's the problem of, what about the poor Desmond? If we just go for the easy stuff, um, then the Desmond's going to lose out. So that's why we need to work out what our campaign's trying to achieve. And we also need to think about diminishing returns. If I uh, give one pound for tiger conservation, will that make as much of a difference as if I give one pound to Desmond conservation? So again, Organisations need to think, what are we trying to do, how much money can we raise, and how much of a difference will that money make? Um, so yeah, these are all important issues when deciding um, when to focus on ugly species. The other thing is understanding the context. So this is another paper uh, from Diogo's PhD. This was, uh, well, yes, an example of sort of the joys of research and uh, finding the unexpected. Um, another colleague from Australia approached us saying he had this amazing data set from the Australian Geographic Society. So this is an NGO based in Australia. They have a series of shops around the whole of Australia in, uh, in the cities and big towns. And for a few months at a time, they have the same flagship campaign in every shop around the country. So on the same day, everyone has on the desk when you go to buy... Um, go to buy gifts from the shop, there'll be a little thing explaining what the uh, campaign is and uh, a collecting tin so you can put your money in. And we just thought this is amazing because um, those campaigns were on a real big range of things. So you can see that there's a seed bank there, marine turtles, coral reefs, specific species. Um, so yeah, this is an amazing list. And the fact that all the data is collected in exactly the same way means that we're going to find really interesting things. And we can you know, work out which of these particular types of project are popular um, with the people donating. Um, and what we found was that there was absolutely no link between the characteristics of the campaign and whether it raised money. The only thing that came out that was important was, was it Christmas? <laughs> um, if the campaign happened at Christmas, you raise more money. Okay? And we think, so you can see here, this is the Mary River Turtle up here, um, which, I mean, I think is really cool. Uh, but that frog there um, got very little money. There's the uh, Bennett's tree kangaroo came really low there. But in the top three were tree kangaroos as a group. Yeah, this was just all over the place. And yeah, we reckon it's just because people trusted that organisation. They would buy something, they would have change, they would put it in the um, collecting tin, whatever happened. So one of our recommendations is, if you want funding for a specific thing, if there's an ugly thing that 
you know, you wouldn't get uh, funding for normally, advertise it at Christmas. <laughs> but again, you know, that really shows the relevance of understanding the context of what's going on. You know, other types of campaign can be, can be completely different. Uh, the other aspect is um, <coughs> emphasizing other factors. So here's the, this diagram from before. As I said, for what's nice is that people do like things because they're endangered and because they're rare. So lots of studies have shown that people are more willing to give to um, campaigns for species <coughs> if they're told that they're rare or threatened. Um, and yeah, so giving that sort of information can make a difference. Often. Lots of information doesn't make a difference, but that simple thing of is it rare or not, um, is, uh, or threatened, is a big thing. Um, similarly, I mean, yeah, I think EDGE is a fantastic uh, campaign, partly because by having the 100 species, they can illustrate it with cute ones. So here's the um, picture of them celebrating their 10 years, and they have a nice, nice picture of a, um, a pygmy three-toed sloth to illustrate it. But it's a way that they've sort of created a new type of flagship, the EDGE flagship. Um, and um, yeah, here they're saying, you know, prioritizing the weird and wonderful. So they actually make uh, an emphasis on, it's not just the standard species. Having said that, I did the screenshot um, of this today from this page. And there's a little thing up there saying donate online. And for that, they use an elephant, um, which again, you know, makes perfect sense. The sorts of people who are looking at their press releases will just be scrolling through. They don't know. Um, yeah, I'm sure that logo is on the top of every page, so they don't know um, what the particular target audience there is. So they're playing it safe. They're going for the species that uh, lots of people are likely to like. Um, another thing is focusing on local aspects. So uh, those of you who aren't from the UK, I'm sure, are gradually realizing how little biodiversity we have in this country. Um, but this campaign uh, from uh, 2016, I think it was, uh, yes, uh, got people to vote on their um, favorite species. The hedgehog came out number one, uh, which you know, is a very cute species. Um, and you can see there are the sort of usual suspects there in terms of um, carnivores and things like that. But what I found was interesting was number seven was the pipistrelle bat, the soprano pipistrelle which actually did better than the bottlenose dolphin. Um, and I think that's partly because the UK has some people who really like bats, um, and uh, uh, bless them. Um, and, uh, but also, yeah, I, of, those, of those species, I don't think I've seen any of them in the last three months, other than the pipistrelle bat that flies around. Um, around my house at night. So yeah, this is a species that people know, that they can sort of have a build up that sort of relationship with. They like seeing it, cheers them up when they see them. And there's an increasing amount of evidence that people will like what others would see as less charismatic species if they're local. You know, we definitely like um, uh, species if we interact with them. Uh, you know, the, if this was an international list, Almost certainly pipistrelles wouldn't appear on it, but in terms of our own species, um, yeah, we're likely to, uh, to rate ugly species more. Apologies to the pipistrelle, which again, I think is nice. <laughs> and then finally, yes, uh, well, finally-ish, be creative. So this is an example that's quite well known in the um, marketing world, uh, which is based on shreddies. So apparently shreddies are only available in the UK, Canada, and New Zealand. Does that sound right? Anyone not from those countries recognize shreddies? No? Okay, so it's a, it's a breakfast cereal that is one of the most boring <laughs> breakfast cereals you can have. Um, and it was in Canada where they noticed that sales were coming down, um, and someone came up with this uh, idea of a campaign that was uh, aimed at, it was done as a joke, but it used humor to raise the profile of, um, of their product. And what they did was that they said that we are, so shreddies are actually square. Is that square? Yeah, that's squarish. So they say, we, we have redesigned the shredding. Okay, we've got a new version. We've created diamond shreddies. Okay, and that's all they did. They had a whole set of adverts of people in the, in the shop moving them. Um, and yeah, they started, oops, sorry, they started selling them. 
as Diamond Shreddies. <laughs> then they started doing Diamond Shreddies cobweb back, so you could have square or Diamond Shreddies. Um, and all of this led to an 18% increase in sales. Okay? So this is the perfect example of how value is not fixed. Okay? It's how the creativity of marketing people took something that is exactly the same and made it sell more, made people value it more. Okay? So I think it's something that we could really do a lot more of in conservation. And finally, yeah, we can learn from the banana slug. Um, so, for years I've been telling this story, whenever anyone mentions cover letters, this is the standard anecdote I tell, um, and I thought I'd repeat it here, and as part of it I actually looked into, um, you know, went on the web to get stuff, and discovered that actually I'd got things slightly wrong. So, that isn't the logo of uh, University of California, Santa Cruz, that is, okay? which makes a lot more sense. <laughs> um, but what was interesting was that my friend didn't know that. Actually, that's the logo of one of the sports teams. Okay, and at the beginning, um, University of California Santa Cruz, which I think prided itself on being different to other universities, um, in their co-ed sports team, they decided we're going to choose that as our logo because we are not like all the other really macho other teams. We're going to have this. Um, and I thought it was, yeah, really interesting that the effectiveness of that meant that my friend who had done her PhD in this place <laughs> didn't know that that was the case. So, yeah, it's an incredibly um, effective flagship. But the other thing in terms of being creative, so there's the original there. Um, but, as I said, it's part of the sports team, so you can have um, the mascot there. He is showing that actually, yeah. They are um, properly strong, tough slugs. <laughs> but a quote from the university website is here. So this, I think, is a lovely example of how a flagship can be, can be relevant. Yeah, it's, it's something that people see, um, but it's also yeah, the, the people there, what's important to them, contemplation, flexibility, non-aggressiveness, and perhaps above all, an iconoclastic challenge to the status quo. So, yeah, I think this is why, you know, it's a lovely example, and this is why, you know, the banana slug is a, an incredible flagship uh, for that university. So, in conclusion, um, I think I've hopefully shown that flagship species are a really important part of conservation. Like I say, we've been using them for decades. It's the sort of thing that whenever you see the work of a conservation NGO, you will see a flagship species. Um, but despite that, I think there's still this attitude that you just have to use a particular set of species. Um, and, I mean, a lot of people um, complain about how, oh, it, I can't raise money for my species. Um, originally, we wanted to call one of our papers um, Stop Moaning and Start Marketing. Um, <laughs> because, yeah, social marketing shows that the way we value things isn't fixed, um, and that there's a whole set of techniques that are tried and tested that we can apply in conservation. So, I think there's lots of ways to raise funds and awareness to benefit ugly species. All we need to do, yeah, we need effort, we need to try, and we need creativity and inspiration. And I think then we can help save ugly species. Thank you very much.